What's up guys, welcome again to Eeps Hideout and in this video, we're going to introduce a new series called Is it worth buying? Where we dissect newly released games and assess whether that game is a bang for your buck or not. Well anyway, for the first game we have here, we got The Cult of the Lamb, which was developed by Massive Monster and published by Developer Digital. Now at first, I really didn't intend to buy the game, but when I saw those creepy yet super cute cartoonish screenshots on Steam and the game being tagged as roguelike, I immediately added it to my cart and just said, yeah, whatever. So basically, Cult of the Lamb is just exactly what the game title suggests. I mean, you'd be playing as a lamb and your main goal is to start a cult. That's why it's called Cult of the Lamb. What? But kidding aside, the game's premise is surprisingly deeper than that. And it all starts with the chain bound supreme deity called the one who waits. Now this dude that has a song title name once saved you from death by resurrecting you back to life. And since there's no such thing as a free lunch, even in the world of the occult, he wants you to return the favor by freeing him from his tormentors. And uh, there's one more thing. He wants you to gather followers so you can start a new cult in his name. That said, there are essentially two main parts of the game. The first one is the dungeon crawler part, where you'll button smash your way clearing rooms one after the other, and the other one is the colony management aspect where you have to oversee the daily operations of your cult. At first, it's really hard to balance the two since these two parts are dependent on each other. I mean, if you spend too much hacking and slashing your way on crusades, you'll find yourself shoveling a ton of poop or wrapping up dead bodies because you can't just leave your flock unattended for a long time. And uh, should you decide to take care of your flock, then there's just no way it will thrive since you can go out there and gather resources to improve your cult to the next level. Anyway, the dungeon runs usually last around from 10 to 15 minutes depending on which level difficulty you're playing in. There are basically four main doors that you have to clear and you have to go through each door four times and fight respective bosses at the final stages before you can truly unlock that door and finally move on to the next one. During the runs, you really can specifically choose your preferred weapon at the beginning and you just have to make use of what's given to you. Now in terms of combat mechanics, Cult of the Lamp is not that complex because you just have to deal with three buttons. One is for melee attack, the other one is for the use of special skills, and the last one is for rolling. Now the game offers you a variety of melee weapons ranging from claws, swords, to axes. Now these weapons have their own pros and cons like using the claws allows you to do quick combos but the downside of it is that it can only deal small amounts of damage. Meanwhile, the big axes can deal a ton of damage to the enemies but the thing is, you can only deal one blow at a time since its attacking animation has a bit of a delay. Some weapons have built-in enhancement in it such as the small life hacks or poison tendencies but at the end of the day, it's really important to choose the weapon you're most comfortable using. Aside from this, you can also use special skills called Curse as your secondary option. These curses can deal extra direct or AOE damage and are quite handy especially if you get cornered or if you get swarmed by the enemies. Just like the melee weapons, you can't pick which curse you'll be using at the start of the run. Some curses allow you to summon tentacles, fire projectiles, but among these, my favorite has always been the black dude that spreads poison to whoever lands on it. These curses work like the typical special skills where they need to be recharged after triggering. And in this game, you have to collect fervor or the little red dots to fill up the meter again. Now since this is a roguelite game, this game wouldn't be complete without the staples such as the in-game upgrade. For this game, this one takes the form of tarot cards which can be acquired by accessing non-hostile rooms during runs. The upgrade that you get are not that usually game-changing in the sense that it doesn't make you ultra-powerful where you can just simply breeze through enemies without getting damaged. To me, the extra lives are the most significant upgrades by far. Other than that, the other upgrades only bump your attack and defense a bit, but although this might sound bad, it actually makes the dungeon run more challenging since you have to rely more on your skill. Once you have cleared all the rooms and completely unlock a certain door, you can still re-enter anytime and gather resources, but the catch here is that the enemies become stronger as you re-enter those doors. 
So after crawling your way through the dungeons, it's now time to manage your cult. Now on top of everything else, the most important component of your cult is your followers. As your humble servants, you can ask them to do various chores and ask them to engage in different activities within the confines of your base. Followers can usually be acquired after defeating bosses and you can also rescue some inside the dungeon stages or purchase them from the flesh peddlers outside. Now once you have enough followers, you need to take care of them by making sure that their daily basic needs are met. And these are faith, hygiene, and hunger. As a cult, the first thing of business you have to take care of is that you have to ensure that your flock doesn't lose faith in their leader. Now, there are plenty of ways to always keep their faith up and one of which is by doing rituals. This involves doing activities like lighting up bonfires, resurrecting a dead follower, and forcing them to do mandatory fasting. Aside from these, you can also boost your faith meter by interacting with your followers by giving them gifts and praising them for their loyalty. Now, another thing that you have to watch out for is the level of your hygiene. If you fail to keep your cult constantly clean, then your followers will surely be prone to diseases or getting severely sick, which eventually leads to their untimely death. To prevent this from happening, you have to constantly clean their poop and make sure to dispose all of dead bodies by burying them at the proper place. Aside from getting contracted by diseases, starvation is also another reason that could lead your followers to the graveyard. Before going through runs, make sure to prepare some tasty dishes and leave them with enough food so they can survive while they're gone. Though the basic ingredients in making food can be easily picked up along the way, you can also plant crop seeds and harvest them later on by building a farm so you can make your food instantly from your own backyard. Now, neglecting at least one of these three elements will make your followers surely grumpy and when they're unsatisfied with the way you run things, they will eventually start descending against you and worse, leave the cult for good. Now once your followers get settled, the next thing you need to do is make some upgrades to your cult. The shrine is where you get to unlock new structures. But before you can do that, you must first collect devotion so you can acquire divine inspiration. Divine inspiration kinda serves as points in the game's tech tree system. And if you have those, you can unlock and eventually construct major buildings. Now as far as devotion is concerned, you may get them from the shrine itself courtesy of your followers' worship. Meanwhile, loyal followers can also provide you with extra devotion from time to time. Making constant upgrades allows your cult to be sustainable and self-sufficient in the long run. As you progress up and up in a tech tree, you can then start to build resource generating structures like stone mines, lumber yards, and eventually you can give your followers a better shelter and your hands will also be free from the disgusting chore of manually picking up their poop thanks to the janitor station. Now aside from doing enhancements for your cult, you can also make individual upgrades and boost the traits of your followers. Doing sermons at the temple allows you to gather devotion from your followers, which in turn can be used to purchase permanent stat boost and gain significant advantages from starting with better weapons, acquiring attacks to increase your health, and the variety of curses you can cast. Meanwhile, gathering commandment stones and using them as crown offerings allows you to preach new doctrines. These doctrines can enhance your followers' traits, such as increase ability to generate devotion faster, force them to be grass eaters, and work for several days without getting tired. Now lastly, you can also do some side quests and travel outside your cult in search for extra resources and interact with the other characters. There are five places that you can visit where you can get necessities like gold, wood, and other materials. And you can also play minigames here from catching fish to playing knuckle bones. Anyway guys, to close this one out, I have to say that buying Cult of the Lamb is definitely worth your money with all the stuff that it offers on the table. I mean, when you play typical roguelite or roguelike games, it just usually has one aspect which focuses on dungeon runs, constant upgrades, and it just literally repeats itself from that point on. With this one, there's the colony building element that you have to pay attention to which adds more depth layer to its overly simple hack and slash facade. I mean, there's literally a bunch of tech trees that you need to consider and you're definitely gonna pour a lot of time on this one. Now in terms of being competitive, I really like the fact that it doesn't have like the 
RPG type of stats that you can just constantly upgrade because although there are permanent upgrades outside, it doesn't make you feel overpowered to the point that you can just bully your way around the dungeons. And I also like the fact that you can choose your own weapon at the start of each run, which again adds another layer of challenge. Anyway, though I really don't have anything bad to say about the game, I'm just a bit disappointed with the lack of variety in weapons and also with the tarot card upgrades. I think they could have added more like bow and arrow or mage staff or you know stuff like that to add more flavor. But aside from that, I think the game is pretty much worth it for its price. Anyway guys, on behalf of Eep's Hideout, once again, this has been Pow, and as always, see you on our next video.